if you are starting in real estate and you think that you are at a disadvantage, figure out a way to create that disadvantage into your advantage or your superpower and leverage it. You're listening to Investing for Good, a show that brings you the stories and strategies of people who are investing to build a legacy for their families, create a meaningful and intentional life by design, and impact the world around them. And now, here are your hosts, Annie Dickerson and Julie Lamb. Hello, everyone. Annie Dickerson here together with my terrific co-host, Julie Lamb. Julie, how are you today? I'm doing excellent. I'm super excited about our guests that we had today on the show. Um, there's just so much like good stuff and so much good energy is probably one of my favorite podcasts that we've recorded. Uh, just all the laughter and the silliness and getting to talk real estate was so much fun. And so just was, you know, super glad to have them on the show today. I don't think there there's ever a day that has gone by in our business when we don't mention bigger pockets in some mm-hmm. way, shape or form. I mean, I think for both of us, Bigger Pockets has had such a big influence on us, especially in the early days of our investing journeys. And so today's guests, Ashley and Felipe, are the co hosts of the Bigger Pockets Rookie Podcast. And so we were thrilled to have them on to really pick their brains to hear about not only their own investing journeys, which each of them invest separately in different types of investments, which you'll get to hear about on the show, but also to pick their brains and hear about um, mindset and advantages, disadvantages, tips and strategies and advice that they have for people who are just getting started in real estate. And they came out with some real golden nuggets in this Mm -hmm. show. Yeah. And it was so fun because I felt like, you know, earlier on when I used to listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast, I I loved it. I mean, I would be driving in my commute, two to three hour commute, and I'd be listening to Brandon and Josh just like, you know, getting on each other and just like the jokes and the laughter um, and love that and definitely felt like so much of that similar energy between Felipe and Ashley as well. But yeah, it was so cool because Ashley had such an interesting story where she's talking a lot about partnerships. I feel like that's the one thing that she kind of kept coming back to was, you know, how she went from not being in real estate at all to suddenly having the responsibility of managing a 40 unit apartment complex, which I can't even imagine. I mean, we've got, you know, larger properties, but we certainly don't manage them. We hire people like her, a property management team, but without any experience just being, you know, dropped into the mix on a 40 unit building. And it was so funny when she mentioned how, when she took over, how they were keeping track of the rents with like a, just a sheet of paper with like a name and like a checkbox of like, have they paid yes or no, which totally mirrors the way I personally manage my own rental property. Properties. Um, it's like rent receive <laughs> check. Is it yeah. within like the ballpark? All right, good. Moving on. I have more more important things to worry about. <laughs> but it was just so cool because I feel like one recurring theme in her story was the partnerships and the power of those partnerships. Which you know, if anyone knows our story and hears us talk about all the time, is the power of our partnership that has allowed us to really catapult our journey in terms of you know where we were and where we wanted to be. Um, so that was really cool, and it was so fun talking to Felipe on his, all of his tips and tricks and strategies. And at the very end, he drops one of probably one of the most valuable hacks we've ever heard on the show um, in terms of, uh, you know, being able to save some money and uh, figure out how to um, cut corners, I guess you can say, and uh, get some free cash that might be lying around. So, uh, but all in all, such a fun, fun show today. So many good nuggets. And, you know, throughout our investing journeys and still to this day, we're always looking to learn more and to try new things. And as part of that is books and podcasts and resources. And so for all of our listeners out there, if you are looking for a great book to really give you a deep dive into what real estate syndications and passive investing are all about, you can get a free copy of our book investing for good. Um, Just text the word book to 41404 and you'll get all of the details on how to get your own hardcover copy of investing for good. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. Here's our conversation with Ashley and Felipe. Ashley and Felipe, welcome to the show. How are you? 
Very good. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. We are thrilled to have you here. Now, Julie and I both credit the Bigger Pockets podcast, the books, the resources for playing such a huge part in our journeys in real estate investing, especially when we were first starting out. Now, you both are the co hosts of the Bigger Pockets Rookie Podcast. And in addition to that, you have both been investing in real estate for a number of years yourselves. So Ashley, I believe you focus primarily on duplexes, which happens to be my personal favorite as well. And you've grown your portfolio to 33 units, while Felipe, you focus on single family homes and currently have, I believe, eight properties, both very impressive portfolios. And we'll dive into your stories. But As you both know, one of the biggest hurdles for most people when it comes to real estate investing is just getting started in the first place and doing that first deal. So Ashley, let's start with you. Tell us how you got into real estate in the first place and tell us about that first deal that you did. Okay, sure. So to kind of sum it up, I graduated college. I was an accountant. I hated it. I quit. I got pregnant, wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and then my friend's dad almost begged me to come and manage an apartment complex for him. It was a 40 unit apartment complex. I had no idea what to do. He had no idea what to do. And so that's how I got into real estate was just doing that part time. And then he kept buying more properties. So I started managing more. And then uh, probably two years into doing that, I partnered with his son on our first deal. So he had the money. I had the experience of two years doing it for his dad. And we purchased a duplex together. We put some work into the upper unit, rehabbed it, and then we refinanced and purchased our next property. Wait a second. So you went from not even having real estate on your radar to suddenly managing 40 units. What was that like? (laughs) So it was the first day was boxes in an office, keys in a drawer, not even labeled. I mean, it was a a really big learning experience, but I think it also made me more knowledgeable today because I literally had to build a property management company from the ground up. And I mean, the leases were one page leases and where do you even see that (laughs) anywhere? And the, the property manager who had been doing it, she had a list and it was just a grid the person's name and she had the months written at the top and she would check with a red marker if they paid or not. And that's how she was keeping track. (laughs) So I, it took me probably by like month 13th, maybe 15th, I had upgraded everything to property management software. We'd taken on another complex and I actually gave all that up in February, managing my own properties and the properties for this other investor. But yeah, it was a a really big learning experience. I bet. I think a lot of people, when they first get into real estate, they don't realize how big of a task it is to manage a property. Or even if you have property management professionally, you still have to asset manage the properties. And I think most people get caught up in, oh, I got to analyze the numbers. I got to make sure it works on paper. I got to get the loan. I got to do the acquisitions piece. And then once they get the keys, they're like, okay, what now? And then they create their own little red pen checklist, right? And they're like, okay. It happens so fast. Like even now when I close on a deal, I'm like, oh my God, I have to like get a tenant in there. I have to like do all these other things. Like, yay, I'm closed. But now the work really starts. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. And so I imagine that all of that property management experience must have been such a big benefit when you got that first duplex and then the subsequent duplexes. Yeah. So I was doing it day to day. So tenant phone calls weren't bothering me then. I mean, eventually they wore me down, but uh, I was doing property management every single day. I was on call 24 seven. So it was like, why not do it for myself? Why not build my own portfolio since I was doing the things that most people hate anyways about owning a rental property? Fascinating. Well, Felipe, let's transition to your story. So tell us, did you have a similar experience? Did real estate just sort of fall into your lap or how did you get involved in real estate investing? Yeah, sure. So first off, thanks for having me on the show, Investing for Good. Such such an awesome uh, show. But what I 
mine's is kind of like a two part two part series of how I got into it. At first, I saw real estate when my parents got divorced, so it came from an ugly situation. In Latin culture, basically, the husband is the guy that's macho and makes all the money and brings that brings that home. And then my mom just kind of stayed home and took care of us. But when my parents got divorced, you know, the money went with my dad. And as you know, my mom was left basically with three children in their teens. And, you know, she had to find a way to provide from not working. So what my mom ended up doing was during the divorce, she was granted the house and our house had a basement loft with a two car garage. So what we ended up doing was converting the downstairs loft in the garage into a three bedroom, one bath living area. And my mom ended up renting that out to basically cover the mortgage. The way I explain it is this. When my parents got divorced, we very quickly felt the water rise up to right about our throat. We were never truly drowning, but we we didn't know where the next mortgage payment was going to be, right? Like it was always just enough. Every month seemed to be just enough. And real estate allowed the waters to go more down towards, right? Like, like more my chest area. I felt a breather after we were able to convert our downstairs into a living area for, for people that we would rent it out to that would now cover our mortgage payment. So now we didn't have to worry about our biggest expense that we had. And I think a lot of times people forget that your mortgage is your largest living expense. And if you can get take care of that first, investing is actually a lot easier. So that's the that's when I first got a taste of real estate. After that, I went to college, did the whole, you know, steps that everyone is supposed to do. After graduating, I went to my goal was to become a police officer. And that didn't pan out. And this is where I got my second taste of real estate. I ended up purchasing a small mobile home here in Nashville, Tennessee during college. It was actually one that I was just going to rent out to hopefully make a little bit of income. See, real estate had always been in my background, but I never really paid attention to it. Anytime I needed money, I always went to real estate. So I had this little bitty mobile home in Nashville, Tennessee that I paid $3,000 for. My goal was going to be to rehab it. Like I was super excited. I was going to rehab this property and I was going to rent it so that I can have a little bit of money so I didn't have to work during college. See, my mom's plan during the divorce kind of stuck with me to always do that, to not have to pay mortgage or rent. So I bought this little mobile home for $3,000. And if any of your listeners know, in 2010, Nashville flooded, right? And with that flood, yep, you guessed it, my house or my, my mobile home flooded as well. So there went my $3,000 investment. Oh, no. The good thing about that is I was a college student and that was my personal resident by having my bills and my mail there that insurance covered the price of the mobile home and then FEMA granted me $30,000. So, yes, oh. for that mobile home. So the return on investment, I've never got that before, but it was definitely a high that I've been chasing since then. So those are the two biggest stories as to how I got invested in real estate. Oh my, how old were you when um, your parents got divorced and, and your mom- uh, Between 11 and 12. And then the mobile home flooded when I was 20. No, that's a lie. When I was 19, 20. Yeah, right in between 19 and 20. Okay. What a valuable experience. I mean, it's heartbreak and, you know, there it's tough situations, but what a valuable experience to have so young in life to really see, oh my gosh, when I, we've got our back against the wall, look, mom can be so resourceful and take what we already have and turn it into an income producing property. And so I love that story, how you go to college and most college guys, they're thinking like dorm parties and like, maybe if they're trying to make money, maybe they'll get a work study job or maybe some will be daring and and play the stock market right but here you are you're 19 20 years old and you're like I'm going to take three thousand dollars and buy a mobile home a mobile home thank you very much <laughs> well, I'm gonna I have to be honest I'll, I'll tell you why I did that so and, and I can I can play smart but but I'm not I, I'm really not that smart and the reason that I felt that I needed that mobile home to help me with cost, was because I don't know uh, how many of your listeners have been to college, going to college, but their advisor is going to give them this sheet of paper with six lines on it, right? And those six lines represent classes that you're supposed to take during your college career, okay? Now, most people know that it's common knowledge to only fill out four or maybe five classes, right? Like that's a lot. 15 hours is a lot your first semester. 
So being Felipe and not have ever been to college or didn't even know that the professor was supposed to help me, I filled out all six. So I took 18 hours of college every semester for three years. So I graduated with my bachelor's in three years because I didn't know that you could take 12 hours or 15 hours. So I didn't have time to work. I literally took 18 hours every single time I got that paper. And then one day my buddy was like, what are, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I got to go to class. He's like, you have class every day? Like, yep, Monday through Friday. I'm like, wow, we go to class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm like, excuse me? And by then I was graduating. I have to add something too about like how Felipe talked about his mom being resourceful and, you know, house hacking. He's also done that himself. He bought his family a camper and he's been airbnb the camper to yeah. turn that liability <laughs> into an asset. So he's definitely uh, got some of his mom's. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It, you know, as, as, as immigrants sometime to this country, you know, my mom has shown me how to be resourceful and treat everything as an asset. If not, you know, even, even the fun stuff, try to treat it as an asset. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like Ashley said, we recently bought a camper for the family, but uh, as it's sitting in my, in my, in my, on my, here in my driveway, I rent it out on Airbnb. <laughs> I love that. We were just talking about that on another episode because I'm looking at um, getting into RVing and whatnot with my family. I have three kids and I was looking at the cost of these things. Well, at, actually, let me back up. I was looking at them to rent on, on Outdoorsy, which is like an app, right? And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. It's like $300 a night for some yep. like newer ones, right? And then mm -hmm. I started thinking, I wonder how much these things cost. And so I looked it up and they're like somewhere around a hundred grand. And then my brain, my real estate brain starts going and I'm like, wait a minute, if I just buy one of these and I'm going to wait a year, I'll buy it brand new. I'll wait a year. I'll rent it out over the next year. It'll just pay for itself by the time we are ready to leave on our, you know, RVing trip next year. And so I love that. I love, you know, I actually do rent mine on Outdoorsy. I do as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's on Outdoorsy and Airbnb. You just link the calendars and they kind of, it kind of flows pretty easy. Oh, uh, the nice. RV is, is a great money machine. It, it, it just pumps out, you know, a couple hundred dollars every month or more. Where do you, do you store it at your house or? Yeah. So I actually had one of my electrician buddies come in and do an outlet uh -huh. so they can just come people from Airbnb just come, they stay for two or three nights and then they leave. And I like that because I can just block the days off that we want to go out. For example, I've been camping with my brothers. Uh, my family and I went out to Chattanooga and, you know, we have, you know, different adventures that we can have with it. It's pretty, it's pretty sweet, especially during COVID. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That is so cool. How big is it? Is it like a 25 footer or is it bigger than that? It's a 20. It's a, no, 20, sorry, it's a 22. Okay. It's just a 22, but it sleeps two, three, four, five, six people. Okay. Okay, cool. They're very used. They're very resourceful with the space in an RV. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's so cool. We'll have to talk more offline about that. We will. We will. I, <laughs> I love how these days, you know, there's so many of those types of platforms and resources to help you turn anything, like you said, turn anything into an asset. Somebody was just telling me the other day about a service called Swimly, I think, where people rent out their swimming pools. So you can <laughs> have a private pool party at somebody else is pool and <laughs> they hilarious. just like they stay in their house and then you get to use their whole yard and their pool it's like it's crazy don't even give felipe ideas He's yeah i'm starting that. to think i wonder if i can use one of my rental properties and put a pool and no, i'm just kidding That's <laughs> or get like a blow-up pool and like you know oh put it in God. your backyard and rent that thing out <laughs> too why that not yeah. that's so going on instagram after this <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I want to dig in a little bit more to each of your stories and how you like, you know, you talked about the first deal that you did. Ashley, you talked about, you know, you had that experience from property management and you took that and you translated that experience from the property management into doing a deal. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there who would love to do this, but they're thinking, how do I even get started? And I think talking about partnerships really scares a lot of people. So tell us a little bit more about how you approached that situation? Did your the owner of the property, did his son approach you or did you approach him? What did that conversation look like? And what advice would you have for anybody out there who might be thinking about, hey, I want to get into more active real estate and I want to leverage the power of partnerships? You know, because as as we all know in, in the world of real estate, partnerships are so valuable, right? Like I wouldn't be where I'm at without Annie and vice versa. Um, in real estate deals that we do, property management companies are so valuable in, you know, the 
acquisition of larger apartment buildings. So talk to us a little bit about how, how that came to be and any advice you might have for people looking to get into partnerships. Sure. Well, my first advice to anyone that wants like to get real estate experience is to find a job you can that's doing that. So in, that doesn't have to be your full-time career. There's so many jobs in real estate that can be part-time, can be a side, side hustle. You can work for a wholesaler driving for dollars where you just send them leads. You can be a leasing agent on Saturdays and Sundays or at nights. You could, you know, get your real estate license you and work off referrals like Felipe's wife does. There's so many, you could do your it. In college, I met this police officer not too long ago that when he was in college, in between his classes, he would do maintenance requests for an apartment complex. And he would just schedule them in between his his uh, classes. And that was his job. And he'd go and, you know, fix whatever needs to be done. So if you can, like, get into something like that and you'll get access to so much information, like people just talking with them, networking with them. Like, if you're the leasing agent, you're going to see every single document that you need uh, to to lease and rent an apartment. For me, like I net, where I had so many networks that when I went to a bank for financing, I wanted to purchase property. I didn't have any money. This would probably would be like my fourth or fifth deal. The bank I had done so much financing for the guy I was working for. They gave me a ninety day unsecured loan to do a cash offer on the property. So there was no wow. collateral or anything. The only catch was that I refinanced long term with them after closing, which no big deal. So working with people who are already investors has so much value to help you get started. So what I did with his son was we had been childhood friends and his son worked, they owned auto dealerships. That's like their, their main investment. And his son worked there very busy, didn't have time to learn real estate. So I just started planting the seed, talking to him about, you know, look what your dad is doing. We could do this. And then I finally found a deal and we went and looked at it together and he said, okay, let's do it. And a lot of it was trust. Like we had known each other so long that we trusted each other. And that was a huge thing because I was doing everything. I was doing the acquisition. I was doing the property management. And then I also, so we are 50, 50 equity in the deal. And then he put all the money in and he was also being paid a mortgage payment every month. So until we refinanced, he was the mortgage holder and received that principal and interest payment every month. So not only was he getting 50% of the cash flow, but and 50% of the equity being built in it, he was also getting that that interest and his principal paid back to him. And that, I mean, people laugh at me like, well, that's a really great deal for him and you're doing all the work, but I, I needed him to get started. I needed that money and I really needed to show everybody else that I could do this. I knew what I was doing and that's really helped me uh, build my portfolio and, you know, work with my other partner and my brother and my sister. I love that you you said that, that you, you know, even though it sounds like on the face of it, that it's like a great deal for him, you acknowledge the fact that you needed him. And I think that's so important when you're first getting into real estate to not just look at things for face value, but really try to understand what is that person bringing to the table? And is it something that you're not really easily going to be able to find somewhere else? Like you have that relationship already with him. And so it makes it really, you know, easy to be able to, you know, break down that relationship relationship with him and say, well, hey, look, it's going to look like this because, you know, you bring this and I bring that. And so I think, so how, how did you guys decide on on the, the splits? I mean, how did you even come to that? Was there a discussion around that? Or because I think a lot of times people are afraid to, to talk about that. They're thinking, oh my goodness, well, I can't ask for that. That's so much. Or should I give this? Because they're bringing so much to the table and they maybe think like, oh, well, I need to give them, you know, 75% of the deal. Like, how did you guys come to that? Was there a negotiation between the two of you? Did you guys just have an open conversation about that? Or what did that look like? Well, the reason we are such good partners is because I have control and he just goes along with everything that I say. <laughs> I know what you mean. About my two partners. <laughs> and really, it was just, we tried to model things after what his dad had done in other business ventures, but also mm -hmm. I wanted to make it an opportunity for him. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't say, I need you to do this. Please do this with me. I didn't beg. I said, look at, I I know that I can make you, I, we, 5.5% interest is what mm -hmm. he was making off of his 
mortgage payment. And then also the equity and the cash flow. I'm like, this is what I can get you. And he loves Vegas. So like his cash flow is his Vegas money. And that was like a huge motivation. <laughs> pain so points. Like, Got to hit those yeah. pain points. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, really it was just, I offered that to him and I showed how his dad was kind of doing that and some other deals, something similar. And it, it was very easy. There really wasn't uh, much negotiation at all. But I think there is no right or wrong way to structure a partnership. I mean, mm -hmm. legally, yes. But as far as the terms of the agreement, mm -hmm. I think it is completely up to you and your partner what you agree on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think really looking at the strengths of each person and what they bring to the table and making sure that each of the strengths and the weaknesses really complement each other is, is really how you can come together and form a solid partnership and one that's going to be valuable for both parties. And I think, you know, when you're trying to sort of convince somebody to come in and do something, always think about those pain points because, you know, when you're able to help somebody solve a problem that is something that is sort of a pain point for them or something that they're trying to personally achieve, that's how you can kind of convince people to come on over to your side or whatever it is you're trying to convince them of, whether it's, you know, partnerships in, in this regard or, uh, you know, raising capital like what we do in our business, always understanding what people need and providing a solution to that is, is also a good thing too. So then, so you bought that first deal together. Was that a duplex? Yes, it was. Okay. And then what did you guys do after that? Because now you're at 33 units. Actually, 35. I just closed on two more. <laughs> well, congratulations. Uh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So then tell us about how you scaled, how you went from, you know, the doing that first deal to how you guys did more, because I think that's a hurdle for, for a lot of people is thinking about how do I go from, you know, doing one or two to, to getting to even 20 is, is sometimes mind boggling when you tell people like, oh, my goodness, I have 20 doors. They're like, what? That's crazy. You know, for, for normal average average people. So tell us about that. Well, my whole thing is OPM, other people's money. And that's one thing I've been really good at. And I, I'm i getting more laxed with using my own money and knowing comfortable that I can like get it back quickly by refining financing. But that's how I scaled was. So I had my first partner, he put the cash in and then we refinance. And then, you know, you can only do so much if you're waiting for one property to refinance before you can go and buy another one. And so he actually put a line of credit on his personal residence. So that enabled us to scale more using that money and then refinancing again, paying that off. Then I also took on a, a second partner. He had some rentals on his own and his dad had actually helped him buy them. So they were owned free and clear because his dad had put in the cash for that and he just paid his dad. And we then put a line of credit on that property. And then I put, I had one that was free and clear by that time. And we used those two line of credits to, to buy more property. We went to banks and just asked, what can you do for us? This is what we're looking to do. And that's where we got the one 90 day unsecured loan and just asking <laughs> for, you know, what, what can you guys do for us at banks? And we did uh, private money too for okay. a while. That, mm -hmm. that was really awesome. We got a great interest rate for that. But really, it's just like f scraping and finding money wherever you can mm -hmm. <laughs> really mm -hmm. helps you scale. And then just the for me, like especially when I first started, I was not comfortable and I was afraid to do it on my own. So having a partner knowing if like something bad really happened, then I would have a partner that would share that loss with me or help me get through whatever that hurdle was. So mm -hmm. that was really my my comfort zone. And I recently re did like my biggest rehab either uh, ever on this four unit apartment complex. And I was opening a liquor store in the bottom and like all of this was new to me doing like a gut rehab, opening a, a retail <laughs> business. So I took on a partner who had experience doing that and we mm -hmm. hopefully are opening this weekend actually, but it was a, it was a great learning experience. So I really love partners. If you want to try something different and they can, you know, help you do that. And you're also providing them, like I had the deal. I already had purchased the building. I had cash and it works out really nice to help each other grow. And where did you find, where do you find these partners? So 
One is my boss. She threatens son. people into. And, and the other one is actually at her liquor store. At her liquor store, she threatens people into business with her. She's like undercover a mob. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, I do feel pretty gangster owning a liquor store now. I do. I just, <laughs> but I might. So one is my boss's son, my childhood friend, and then the other one actually married his sister. So they're brother in laws. Uh-huh. So it's like funny. They're like part, kind of the same family now. But him, I knew for two years before we actually started investing together, and we started out with the duplex, and then grew from there. And then my other partner is my sister. When she graduated college, we bought a duplex together. She mm-hmm. got the mortgage. She did an FHA loan. So it was only three and a half percent down where mm-hmm. if I would have, we bought it in a nicer area and I didn't have enough cash for a 20% down payment or to purchase it fully right out. So she did the, the FHA mortgage and it was just in her name. And mm-hmm. we went 50, 50 on the deed. And then mm-hmm. I gifted her the down payment. So she gets to live in one. She pays $50 out of pocket towards the mortgage. The other tenant is paying most of it. And then I invested the down payment. And eventually when she moves out, I'll get 50% of the cash flow. And then when, if we ever sell it, I'll get, you know, 50% of the equity in it. So that one's Mm -hmm. kind of a long-term play. Mm -hmm. And then for my brother, he's my other partner where for Christmas, I just gifted him 25% of a Mm -hmm. duplex as his Mm -hmm. Christmas gift. And he doesn't do anything or Probably doesn't even know the address. Of the property <laughs> that we asked them. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. That is so wild. So, you know, anybody who's listening out there, partnerships and networking are so key to getting to where you want to go. And I, you know, I, I, I've been asked that myself on podcasts, like what is like the, one of the things in the early days that really helped me get from where I was to where I wanted to be. And hands down, it was networking. I mean, I talked to anyone and everyone who would listen to me, you know, ramble about real estate and, you know, just like, you've got to learn about this thing. And then, you know, lo and behold, other partnerships started to form. People would say, well, the next time you did a deal, you know, let me know. And so get out there and start talking to people because you never know who you're going to meet and who, what kind of deals you might be able to, to do. So I love all of that. That's exactly right. Like even when I first started, I was like, I think two years before I even found bigger pockets. And like once I was on there, I was like in the forums talking to people. And in just a year and a half after the, I found Bigger Pockets, I tripled my portfolio just from networking with people online. Yep. Crazy. Yep. Yeah, totally crazy. That's so wild. When I first stumbled upon Bigger Pockets four years ago, I was selling a property here in the Bay Area and was like, what do I do next? And Googled something. I don't know what I Googled. And it was like an article or a forum in Bigger Pockets. And then I fell into a rabbit hole. And <laughs> here I am, quit my job, raising millions of dollars every year, buying apartment buildings. So it's right. it's wild. The power of networking is crazy. Okay, Felipe, I want to talk with you a little bit more because I'm sure you've got some tips and tricks up your sleeve. <laughs> and so tell us tell us a little bit more about you and how you got to... So you're at eight units right now, right? Correct. Does that include the RV or no? <laughs> eight and a half then, right? <laughs> okay, eight and so, a half. So, All right. So what I do is, is we have eight single family homes converted into duplexes. So Whoa. 16 okay. dwellings and then eight structures, if that kind of makes sense, plus the RV. <laughs> Interesting. And do you have to, when you bought those properties, did you check zoning to make sure that you could convert them or how, what did that, what does that look like? Yeah. So learning curve, right? I'm one of those guys that's just like running through the wall. And as I hit roadblocks, I worry about it then. Uh-huh. So yeah, the city called me one day. I was like, Felipe, you have six cars in front of the house. What's going on? And I'm like, oh, well, let me explain. So I asked the lady, I said, you know, are we allowed to have, you know, how many people are we allowed to have in a dwelling in this city? And they're like, well, four people that are unrelated can live together. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, great. So two brothers living together. She's like, doesn't count. I was like, great. Uh, it's actually a whole lot of people. Now, obviously, we don't want to have a thousand people in a house. But what we do is we rent the upstairs to a family and the downstairs to a separate family. And it's not considered, you know, breaking any codes or any laws like that. Now, it is different if we have to separate the mailboxes or separate the utilities. Then it's two separate dwellings and you do have to zone it separately as a multifamily. But mm-hmm. since I leave the address the same and leave the bills under my name anyways, then there's uh, I'm, I'm abiding within the laws. Interesting. Hmm. How did you even think to do that in the first yeah. place? I mean, well, I if think- you remember, I, when my parents got divorced, that's what my mom did. 
Yeah. She did it in the downstairs. Right. She did. She she rented to a family in the downstairs. So I said, okay, great. So now my mom pays her mortgage by them. But I was like, wait a minute. What is my mom doing with her mortgage that mm -hmm. she was paying before? So my cash flow in one of these houses is about twelve hundred per house. So I'm cash flowing about twelve hundred to a thousand dollars per house. Wow. <laughs> That is yeah. wild. That is so wild. So are these, are these all in the same area? They're like within a mile of each other. Yeah. I okay. buy literally this one little section of Nashville, Tennessee called Antioch. It's a very C plus neighborhood. Very, it's empty from nine to five, full from five on, right? It's everyone's going to work. It's uh super blue collar. And I love it because most of my tenants are like traveling construction workers. So when you hear of traveling professionals, your mind automatically goes to nurses, right? But we tend to forget like the people that are working in your downtown building these high rise, only about 60 to 70% of those people actually live in the city. The rest were brought in by those companies because they didn't have to want to retrain certain, you know, material or things that they're going to be using. So they bring in professionals in that field of welding or a crane driving or whatever, instead of retraining. They just pay them 12 months or 18 months worth of contract and say, hey, if you live in Nashville and work on this, we'll give you 18 months guaranteed work. And they get, you know, two, three thousand dollars of, of living expense. But most of these guys don't bring their family. Right. They just go home on the weekends or whatever. So they're like, oh, I can rent a bedroom from Felipe for five to six hundred dollars a month, all bills included. Or I can go pay these two thousand and rent a house that I don't need. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a win win for everyone. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. That's that's something that like, you know, you never think of until you get into that space, that niche, and then you discover, wow, I can really serve these people. So when you're looking for one of these properties, I'm curious, so you're buying a single family home. Is there anything you're looking for in these properties that cues you to say, oh, I can convert this into sure. two units? So I'd love to meet the contractor that built these houses because this is, I don't have any competition. Basically these houses are a three bedroom, one bath upstairs with no master. So it's three, three 12 by 12s, mm -hmm. a bed, uh, a, a full bathroom in the, in the hallway basically. Right. And then a giant uh, living room and a dining room. Hmm. So then the downstairs is the exact same square footage just under, and it's got a two car garage and a loft. So the loft is the size of the kitchen and the dining and the living room, and then the the two garages is the size of the three bedrooms and the bathroom upstairs. Mm. So I literally just take a photographic picture and do the exact same thing downstairs. Three bedrooms, one, and then I can rent upstairs and downstairs as two separate dwellings. I knock out the two garage doors. I put a block, add a window and some doors. Boom, boom, boom. What's really cool is these houses have the plumbing downstairs, the washer and dryer are downstairs, which to me converts into a bathroom, hot water, cold water, right? And then the loft becomes a master bedroom, two or three bedrooms for the kids, kitchen right in the middle. I literally just do the same thing that's upstairs, downstairs. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. So that's so funny. You just described my house, like <laughs> the one that I live in right now. Like, and, and that's actually why we moved into this house was because the layout was exactly like that. It would allow sure. us to live upstairs and then rent out the downstairs. And so I love that. That's so funny. So what what's next for you? So you've got these eight or 16 units. Like what's what's next? What are your what are your plans? I'm curious. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this model, I, I've, I've, I think all of us in real estate kind of get really good at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think wealth is really built by just repeating the boring, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about like, I've always, I've, I've mentored under a couple of people who tell me you're one deal away from one of two things, either becoming wealthy or you're a deal away from going broke. And he goes, mm -hmm. most of the time you go broke by getting outside of your lane. I'm not saying don't try something different, but in but stay in your lane with what you're already good at and you know it works. If I yeah. can cash flow a thousand bucks from one house, why wouldn't I get a hundred of those? Right. Right. So basically I'm just redoing my same model over and over and over and over and over again, making it boring. And I've become my own bank now. So what I did was I paid off one house, one house completely cash. I put a line of credit on it. And if if you're anything in real estate, you know that you can just rinse, wash, repeat. You buy another house cash, you refinance, you pay off the line of credit, and then you just do it again and again, and again. So you can just keep doing that, right? That process. And then luckily that value goes up in that house. So every two years when my line of credit is up, I just ask for a higher line of credit because my property value went up. So essentially I've 
become my own hard money lender, my own bank, whatever the case may be. On the side of that, I'm, I'm mentoring under another gentleman right now, learning the, the art, if you will, of wholesaling because I want to buy more of these faster, right? Like I can only, I'm, I'm right now just limited to the MLS, but if I can go direct to seller, then my, that's going to be my game plan is to, you know, basically keep the best of those houses wholesale or flip the rest. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then outside of that, since I've become my own bank, I've learned the issue with credit and how a lot of people have uh, this problem. Mm-hmm. One of the main things that I'm learning to do right now, aside, so I tell a lot of real estate investors that all my, I, I'm, I'm a broke real estate investor. All my money goes back into <laughs> buying more houses, right? Mm-hmm. Like I don't have fun cash to go buy the Tesla that I really want to buy. So <laughs> all my money goes back into real estate. So my, my goal outside of that is showing people how to fix their credit. Not much to do with real estate, but a big downer when people, it, that takes people a year to get into real estate because their credit isn't you know where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. So I've started networking with some high level individuals about how do you, how do you leverage so much credit against yourself and not get hurt? So I'm learning the process of how to fix and help other people with their credit. And this will be part of my answer when you ask me later in regards to what I'm doing, you know, for, for the good of, of the world. And we can, we can get into that. So just a little sneak peek of that to answer a little bit of your question there, Julie. Nice, nice. nice. Well, exciting, exciting stuff. I always like hearing about people's strategies to try to get to the next level and sort of, you know, accelerate the wealth building because, you know, that's, that's really how we get to where we want to be, which is, you know, by scaling and growing. So I love that. Okay. I want to transition really quick and talk a little bit about the podcast and what you guys do there and maybe some lessons and tips and tricks you guys might be able to share with the audience. So tell us a little bit about, you must hear a lot from people in terms of like what their mindset is. Tell us, talk to us about that because we talk about that a lot on our show about mindset and the mindset that you need. And, you know, a lot of times when you're just getting into real estate, you struggle with, you know, the traditional mindset of, you know, going out, going to school, getting a job, buying a house and working for the next 30 years. So you must hear about some of the mindset that people, you know, struggle with or what it takes. Talk to us a little bit about that, about what you guys hear from your guests on your show. Well, our first guest ever, Lauren and Kyle, they have an Instagram of Rentals to Wealth and they, you know, are amazing. Everybody loves them. They do great stuff. All these burrs, they're hands-on. And they had analysis paralysis for five years before oh they started gosh. investing. And just like how amazing they're doing now. It's like, oh my God, where would you be if you started five years ago? But they, they eventually took action. But we've also had guests where they, within 30 days, they had, you know, they're like, oh, real estate. And they cram through books and podcasts and they, you know, close on their first deal. So it's really been a mix of people. But really just taking that action. I mean, the sooner you take it, the better, but getting over that fear. And if you have that fear, what is that fear? Is it, you know, that you're going to lose your money? Okay, use someone else's money. Is it fear that you are going to lose someone else's money? Put a plan in place, put together these multiple exit strategies. So if you're going to buy something and you want to rent it out, okay, what happens if you can't find a renter, you can't refinance, make up all those scary scenarios in your head and put solutions for them. So Mm -hmm. you can't rent it out. Okay. Can you sell the house? Can you flip it? Can you Airbnb it? So just go through those scenarios that are scaring you, that are stopping you and, you know, find solutions for Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Such sage advice. I think I went through something similar when I um, was thinking about quitting my job. I had all these fears in my head about what could go wrong. And I heard on a podcast, somebody said, just write it down. Just take all those fears and just put it on paper. And I did that. And it was these huge fears in my head. And I wrote them down on paper. I was like, that's not so bad. It's just a few lines. And I think a lot of newbie real estate investors probably experience the same thing that, you know, they read all these articles, they go on bigger pockets and they're overwhelmed by all these people doing incredible things and telling them the right way to do things, the wrong way to do things. And it's no wonder people get stuck in analysis paralysis um, for five years even. And (laughs) so I think if you just take your fears and you put them down on paper, then you realize, oh, okay, well, I can come up with a plan B if that happens. Yeah. So. I've been talking to someone who they have a couple rentals already. 
She's a real estate agent. Her husband owns a construction company. Like that's a perfect burr marriage right there. And so they've done this before and she's looking at her next property and she's like, oh, I don't know. And she's looking to use private money. And her fear is that she won't be able to refinance and pay them back. Well, I dig a little deeper and she's already been pre-approved for like way more than whatever that property <laughs> refinance would be. It's like you have everything. You are like a perfect situation. Just, you know, you just have to do it. And it it really yeah. is a lot of times just a mindset hurdle and just mm -hmm. getting over it. And like even just talking to someone about it, like laying it out and then have them like tell you back, like you can do this. Like you have all the tools to do it. There really is no worst case scenario that you think that there is. And sometimes hearing it from someone else or having someone else make you say it out loud really helps to to kind of get you in the right mindset too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, so, you know, I think a lot of people get stuck on the disadvantages of being a beginner. I have this stacked against me. I can't do this, this obstacle. But let's flip that around for a second because you guys talk to all sorts of people in real estate investing. What do you think are some of the advantages of being a rookie in real estate investing that maybe some people who have been in it for a long time don't have. Yeah, we definitely can do that. So let me give you an example of, so I have a, I have a good friend of mine. We just interviewed her. Her name is Amy. And she, see what she did was she found deals, but didn't have the money to fund them. So she got invested with a hard money lender, but not just that, she actually recruited her son and said, hey, you're gonna do this with me and we're gonna do this together and I'm not gonna be scared and we're gonna figure this out, right? Now, her outcome isn't everyone's typical outcome, but she got over the fear of investing, right? And what she did was she created $100,000 in equity on one flip. Now that's not like the norm, right? We're lucky to get 20,000, but she got over her hump of fear and on the other side of that was the success that she was looking for. So kudos to her. She's an awesome lady. Follow her, Amy Swayze on Instagram. And, and I would add to that, you know, a minute ago, you were saying, you know, our weaknesses, you know, things like that. And I think a lot of the times the word even weakness comes with a derogatory or a negative connotation, which I'm learning now is probably more your superpower. And I'll explain this in two separate ways. First, when I was younger, I grew up on the construction site, but I was never, like I said, I'm not super smart. So I never grew up like learning a trade, which I thought was a weakness, but it actually become, became a positive because all I knew was plumbers, framers, electricians, painters, you know, all sorts of guys in the construction site. And I knew everyone, but I was never one of them. I was never the plumber, the painter, but I knew everyone. And if you're in real estate, that's gold. I didn't, ha I, I knew everyone. I knew the plumber, the electrician. So I'm able to do all my deals at like 30% of what everyone else is paying because I know everyone. Right. So I thought that was my disadvantage when I was getting into real estate, which became my superpower. Right. So find a way to leverage your disadvantage towards your advantage, right? Make it your superpower. Right. I'll give you another perfect example of, of when starting in real, because you, you said starting in real estate, right? So like Another one of those for, for even for me was like when my son was born, right? My son has what's called SPD, which is sensory processing disorder. For example, he only sleeps three hours at a time, even, even at night, like to this day, he'll only sleep from nine to 12, wake up for an hour, one to three, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's how we work. Now I could have used that as a disadvantage. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm not sleeping. I, I can't invest in real estate or I can't do this or, you know, loud noises affect my son. So we can't go to certain places. Right. But I ended up using that as an advantage as well. I call it my son's superpower, right? My son has SPD. He's actually right back there. He is His SPD actually became our superpower in the family. For example, Netflix is out of the window. Radio in the car is out of the window. So now I do phone calls in the car. I've literally doubled, if not almost tripled my net worth just this past two years because my son has come into our lives and not gave me the luxury of wasting time. So what I would tell your listeners are, if you are starting in real estate and you think that you are at a disadvantage, figure out a way to create that disadvantage into your advantage or your superpower and leverage it because somebody somewhere wishes they had the problem that you had, right? People wish that they would have known all the all the all the contractors in Nashville, Tennessee. I know them all, right? Because I worked with them. So yeah, that's what I would tell your listeners is to focus 
you know, if, if you're going to be focusing on your disadvantages, make them into your superpower in investing in real estate. Such that's amazing. Oh I got goodness. chills when you I said know. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think also that speaks to, you know, having an attitude of gratitude. And when you can look at everything that you have in your life and be grateful for everything that you have and turn things from a negative into a positive, it has so much more power than you would even imagine. It's something that I've personally been working on in my life for the last couple of years. And it just has transformed the, my ability to, to grow and and scale and do so much more because i'm living in a positive mindset and and so i love that i love i love that i have that written down in quotes on my notes and love that we'll get back to our conversation with ashley and felipe in just a minute have you been thinking about investing in real estate but aren't sure you have the time or the desire to manage the investment Perhaps you're afraid, like we were, that you'll make the mistake of choosing the wrong market or the wrong team and lose your entire investment. Well, that's exactly why we created the Good Egg Investor Club. We do the work of identifying solid real estate investment opportunities in the best markets around the country and then partner with you to acquire these investments and then we'll all share in the returns. We'll identify the growing markets, strong, experienced teams, and the solid deals. We do all the heavy lifting of managing the tenants and the renovations, and as a passive partner, you get to enjoy all the benefits of investing in real estate, monthly cash flow, long-term appreciation, and the ongoing tax benefits. When we first discovered passive investing through real estate syndications, we realized it fit perfectly into our busy lives. We could put our money to work for our families, work less, and get more time back in our days so that we could focus on what matters most and discover our true passion and purpose in life. We've now helped hundreds of people invest passively in real estate syndications and are seeing the positive impact it's had on their lives. We invite you to partner with us by joining the Good Egg Investor Club today so you can start putting your money to work for you and get more time back in your day because we know that when people have more time in their days, they can do the true work they were intended to do and the world will be a better place. To sign up for the Good Egg Investor Club, go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest and we'll take it from there. That's goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And now, back to our chat with Ashley and Felipe. All right. Well, shall we transition into the investing for good impact round? We're going to ask you guys a couple of questions, and I want to ask you guys each separately. So we're going to kind of move through these. I want to know what your answers are, because I think I would love to hear each of you, because I think you'll have different answers to both. But we're going to ask you guys three questions around investing for good. Ashley, we'll start with you. So the first question is investing in yourself. So what is one way that your investments are helping you to live a better life? Well, the first, I have two things to, to put onto that. So yeah. the first thing is, is when I be, I was able to pay off all of mine and my husband's personal debt. So I paid off our cars and then we had equipment loans and we had a line of credit paying that off. And that really has even just like strengthened our relationship, just not worrying about money anymore. So that has really been a, a big benefit to us and being debt free besides our, our mortgages on the rental properties in our house. And the second thing is, so this school year with COVID, our public school was only going back two days a week. And my son really needs that five days a week. So private schools are doing five days a week. So we enrolled him into private school, but I have to drive him every single day, drive him to school and pick him up. And at first I thought of this as just like, this is going to be so annoying. This is awful. Like <laughs> I can't just get up, get my coffee, send them on the bus and then start my work day. And I was talking to someone else who he, he drives his, his daughter to school every single day. And he was just, oh, I just love this. I get to do this. What other dad gets to do that? He's like, mm -hmm. I get this time with her in the morning. I'm like, I feel awful, but I'm like, you're, you're so right. And it was just such a mind shift change that like, I get to do that. I get to leave at 8 a.m. and take him to school and I get to go at three o'clock and pick him up. Like not a lot of people get to do that. So mm -hmm. that was a huge mindset shift for me. And now I like love our car rides together. Yeah. Well, that's like exactly what 
Felipe was just saying, right? It's like taking a situation that you have Mm -hmm. and flipping that around and really just, it's the same situation. It's just the way that you're looking at it and how that changes everything for you in terms of, you know, the the value of, of that time or those moments. And I love, you know, the paying off the debt. I think sometimes people don't realize the the mental burden that that has on you and in your relationships with the people that you're closest with. And when you're able to free up financial resources, whether it's paying off debt or having additional income streams, how that changes the the people, the relationships with the people in your life and in a positive way. And so I love, I love that. All right. Second question is, and if you have more than one, would love to hear it, but what is one or two investment strategies or hacks that you might be able to share with the audience that um, will help them catapult their investing journey? I would say if you are young or you don't have a family that is against this, definitely start out house hacking. Mm-hmm. I My sister went 21 buying her first property. She, I mean, she's paying $50 a month to live in an apartment that could probably rent for $800 a month. And mm-hmm. then her tenant is paying down the mortgage every single month for her. And I mean, it's just, she's building wealth already and it's just, I mean, it's just an amazing tool. And it's not like you can also do the rent by the room and rent out your rooms. I mean, that's another great way to do it, too. But she was very against that. She wanted her own space, didn't want to share a kitchen. So buy a duplex, buy a fourplex and, you know, and then in a couple of years, grow into another one. Yeah. Yeah. Annie and I both came from house hacking. That was how we got into real estate. Annie was still house hacking um, up until recently, which is which is amazing. But yeah, can't speak to enough of the power of leveraging, you know, the ability to pay down your debt using somebody else's mm-hmm. paying rent. And it's right. like a win-win yeah. for, for everyone. So I love that. All right. Last question is around investing in the world. So what is one way that your investments are helping to make the world a better place. Liquor stoves. Well, yeah, I'm providing liquor and wine <laughs> to the community. <laughs> I love that. Very much needed right now. That's for uh, sure. <laughs> well, I guess I could kind of go off of that. So the building that I bought was, is in a very small town where there's lots of vacant buildings uh, on mm-hmm. that street. Mm-hmm. So we completely transformed that building. And now there is the liquor store and there is a boutique little like clothing gift store down there which the town has never seen anything like that before and then there's two uh, residential apartments upstairs and one uh, resident has she's lived there forever wants to stay so we just updated her apartment a little bit then the other apartment we completely gutted it and made it brand new and it's the nicest apartment that you can get in the town but also affordable But really just, I love talking about real estate and I love just giving out as much content as I can on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. I haven't been as good as I used to be, but I used to do these whiteboard posts that just gave as much content as I could fit on a whiteboard Mm -hmm. and give out and just doing the podcast. I love that and meeting uh, new people and being able to help them in any way, but I, I kind of find out that they help me more. It's like what goes around comes around Uh and I end up getting, you know, little lessons from them. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. The, you know, sharing of information. I was talking with somebody the other day and he he's new to real estate. And he was saying that one of the things that he's realized about real estate investors is how everyone loves to share. (laughs) And there's not like all this competition with like, you know, other professions. It's like with real estate, everyone is just really open. And, uh, and so I I love, I know that's true for Annie and I as well. It's why we do what we do here at the, at the show investing for good and in our business as well. So, I was talking um, to someone just yesterday and I was explaining to them what wholesaling was. And they're like, oh, that'd be like a great podcast episode. And oh, well, that's probably like proprietary information what you're telling me. You probably don't like tell people that. I'm like, no, this is what I've heard from people saying on my podcast. I've already done these shows. Like people talk about it. I'm like, there are no secrets in real estate uh-huh. investing. And he yeah. was just shocked by that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. All right. Felipe, you're up. All right. Three questions around investing for good. First question is investing in yourself. So what is one way that your investments are helping you to live a better life? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for me, the the family is huge, mm-hmm. right? So like as much time as I can with my family is big to me. Like 
riding in a car uh, for two hours uh, in the morning. They're like, that's not enough for me. I need like smothering my family. So what I did was I, as quickly as possible, retired me and my wife through real estate investing. Mm -hmm. And my method's a little different than most people. So my method is more of, and this is where it's really important for people to have your goal. And my goal was to have the most amount of cash flow with the least amount of properties because I'm not worried about net worth. I'm more worried about cash flow. And how mm -hmm. I can start living my life now, right? Mm -hmm. So, at uh, I'm not going to do the numbers for you, but if you've listened and paid attention, you kind of know where I'm at financially in cash flow, and that's a very comfortable place. So, investment has given me all of my time back with my family. I'm actually in sweats right now, and it's about the four in the afternoon. And I just don't feel like changing, and that's okay because I don't have to for <laughs> anyone. So, real estate has given me a very time full life. Time full life. I like that. That needs to be a tweet somewhere. But that all came from a book that was called Life and Air. And that really changed my perspective on what I wanted to do. Like how much time can I spend? Because that's exactly what you do with your time. You spend it. And it's mm -hmm. very important to do it wisely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. I've read that book. It's such a good one. That book, Life and Air, is so good for, I think, folks who are really stuck in the mindset, the traditional mindset of, you know, go out, go to school, get a job, buy a house and work for the next 30 or 40 years and right. never really, you know, getting to where you want to go or feeling that way anyway. But it's such a good one to help you with the mindset of like, you know, if you're kind of stuck in that place, such a good one. But yeah, and, and I love that. Same for me as well. Time with my family. It just never seems like enough. And real estate has definitely given that to me as well. So I love that. Okay. Second question is investing in others. So same as with Ashley, if you have more than one, happy to hear that. But if you have one investment strategy or life hack that you can share that'll help our audience kind of catapult their investing journey, what would that be? I'm about to give you a hundred house hacks. Do I'm it. House, I'm, do I'm, it. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the life hack king. Are you ready for <laughs> okay, this? Okay. Do it. Are you sure? Yep. I think Annie's a little nervous over there. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to go on. So like I said, time is very important to me, right? One of the, one of a bunch of hacks that I use, and I love talking about this, like for example, any store that I shop at right before I shop, I'm on eBay. And is there a coupon for this? I have saved thousands of dollars a year by just having a coupon. For example, the other day I was at Old Navy and I went on eBay and I typed in Old Navy coupon. And sure enough, there was a 50% <laughs> off your whole purchase for $2. Blew my mind. I have the receipt on my Instagram. Um, I was at Home Depot and I found this one. At Home Depot, you can literally buy 20% off your whole purchase coupons for $3 as well and you shop online. So as I'm going through the aisles, I'm just clicking on the things that I'm going to buy. I go grab lunch, I come back and they have it for me at 20% off so I didn't have to shop, right? So again, if you're, if you're following me, all this is back to my time, right? Mm -hmm. Another example, we don't shop for our food anymore. We have our, sh our food cooked for us. Now that might seem... Like, why would you do that? Well, that's 45 minutes not at the grocery store. That's 30 minutes not cleaning. And that's 30 minutes not cooking. If mm -hmm. I can use that time wisely, I should have a way higher return on my investment than spending two and a half hours of my day cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are all things that go back to time. And I, I can just keep going and going and going. How Believe we've structured you do our life. You have to say the, the one no, about Home Depot, no. oh, the price guarantee. Oh, oh the price that guarantee. Oh, I thought, what, you, I thought you were going to tell you about the house cleaning. Okay, no, so no, no. The, the house, oh, this one, we he said it on I our podcast, and me and the girl, you. like our jaws dropped. Like the guys, we were speechless, and he like never <laughs> leaves anyone speechless. <laughs> so, so with Home Depot, if you just and it's just about starting a spreadsheet, even on your phone, and you know what, you don't have to do it on your phone anymore. I find another hack to this. Basically, I'll sell the hack, and then I'll tell you how it works. If you go to Home Depot and you buy any item, it doesn't matter when they price match guarantees that for eighty nine days, right? So ninety days, basically. They price match guarantee. And that's awesome because if you buy a leaf blower in the winter or in the fall, you're going to get a cheaper price in the winter. So you buy it now and in 90 days, they're going to lower that by 20% because it's going to go on sale and you're going to get that in a gift card. So what I do is at Home Depot, I just tell them to e-receipt me my receipts. So once every 20 or 30 days, I go back to 90 days past the 30 days that I had and I just check all the emails from Home Depot and I send all of those, all those receipts to Home Depot and say, hey, I have any of these prices changed. And I get, you know, hundreds of dollars in e-gift cards from Home Depot because they price match, they guarantee their prices for 90 days. 
Oh my goodness. That you know, every is single wild. item you buy there, just have it sent to your email. And then every 30 days, check your email for the past 90 days of purchase and just send all of them to Home Depot and just say, hey, has any of these changed? And they'll just send you. And as investors, we shop at Home Depot all the time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So their stuff changes all the time. Yeah. So, so I got tons yeah, of these. <laughs> love that. So anyone out there who's looking at doing some rehabs, shop at Home Depot, do Felipe's thing and no, no, save wait a minute, money. Wait a minute, I mean, that's wait a minute, crazy. Wait a, wait a minute. <laughs> Let, if you're doing a rehab, do not uh-huh. shop at Home Depot, okay? Okay. You get an Amazon. Yeah, I don't do this kind of okay. stuff. So you I get don't an know. Amazon Tell us credit card. <laughs> you get an Amazon credit card uh-huh. from Amazon from Amazon.com. Okay. You get a credit card. They own Whole Foods. So then you take uh-huh. your credit card, you go to Whole Foods and you buy Home Depot gift cards. You are going to get six, five to six percent cash back on that gift card. Uh-huh. And then you use that gift card to buy your purchases. And then uh-huh. 90 days later, you're going to get some money back. But let's say on my last rehab, I spent ten thousand dollars. What's five or six uh-huh. percent of ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand or whatever you spent? Yeah. So that's another hack where I've been able to make back about 20 grand last year. Oh my gosh, that is wild. So can you buy gift cards in that large amount like that? Yeah, you can buy them as high as 500. So $500. So I buy two of them for a thousand dollars. And typically you're not going to spend a thousand dollars a rehab a day. So I literally wake up in the morning. You can go grab a cup of coffee at Whole Foods, buy a thousand dollars worth of gift cards. Take that's 5% cash back on that one. You take your gift card to Home Depot, you order online. So you get 20% uh-huh. off with the coupon online. Uh-huh. And then in 90 days, you submit those receipts back to Home Depot and get an additional, typically about 10% back. So I'm doing that about is... 18 to 25% cash back. That Extreme is couponing wild. is. Uh, I know, right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually not a lot of work. Like it's actually really easy uh, to yeah. do. Really, really easy to do. Last question is around investing in the world. So what is one thing that you're doing right now or that your investments are doing to make the world a better place? Sure. So right now I'm actually using my investments to beta produce a product where we're going to be helping people fix their credit. And I'll drop a huge bomb here. Anytime you go to the car dealership, you shop on Amazon, you're on Facebook, all these places, believe it or not, give their information to the bureaus, right? Equifax, uh, the the three bureaus. Now, I didn't know this until recently, but those three bureaus are independently owned, not government owned. So if they don't have your written documentation permission to purchase your data from these companies, then it is illegal. So what we're doing is we're going to help people fix their credit by sending in letters to the bureaus for certain hits on your record and say, hey, do you have documentation that I allowed you to buy my data? The answer Mm -hmm. is always going to be no, and they have to drop that off your credit score. And I'm talking like, um, you know, people who are filing for bankruptcy, people who are applying for cars. As investors, you guys know that we apply for loans all the time. So Mm -hmm. only the loan that you received is allowed to be on your credit. All the other ones legally have to fall off in 30 days. They just never do because you don't report it, right? Mm -hmm. So my investments have taught me the power of your credit and how your data is so important in, in, in who does have it and who doesn't have it, right? Mm-hmm. There's so many people that are like, oh, well, I'm going to get an investing, but I have to wait a year because I got to fix my credit. And I'm, I, I didn't, that didn't sound right to me. So I mm-hmm. did a little digging, reached out to some of the high net worth people who, are, who use credit quite a bit. And they, were, they taught me how to basically remove inquiries off your credit because it's not there legally. And that just blew my mind. And I was like, mm-hmm. what? So through real estate, I'm repurposing some of those, some of those monies to start a business that's going to help people mm-hmm. in regards to their credit score, right? Mm-hmm. There's tons of people that don't have housing, don't have the vehicle they need to get to work. Yeah. They fall into this, this, this whirlwind of, I can't get a car, so I can't get a job, so I can't get a house. Yep. And they become homeless yep. because of their credit. Mm-hmm. And if only they knew that they could literally, I'm not joking. You can literally just call in and say, Hey, these aren't legitimate. And they take them off immediately. Mm -hmm. I love that about both of your stories, how, you know, you're, you're not just accumulating wealth and building your portfolios for yourself, but you're finding little tricks and tips along the way. And I can tell it through both of your stories and your, the way that you talk about everything you've learned, you're just so passionate about giving back and sharing with others everything that you've learned, which is so perfect as co-hosts of the Bigger Pockets Rookie Podcast. Um, so tell our listeners, um, what's the best place that they can go to learn more about both of you and to connect with you? 
Well, I can say it since I say this 50,000 times on the <laughs> Record Podcast. You ready? Go for it, Ashley. Yeah. Do them both. <laughs> so you can find me at Wealth From Rentals, and you can find Felipe Mejia at Felipe Mejia, R-E-I. <laughs> I love that. Instagram. And then we also have uh, the Real Estate Rookie on Facebook. So if you search Real Estate Rookie, it will come up. Ashley and Felipe, co hosts of the Bigger Pockets Rookie Podcast. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your infinite wisdom with us. Thanks, Thank guys. It was a pleasure. Us. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Annie. You've been listening to Investing for Good, the number one podcast for people like you who are investing to build a legacy for their families, create a meaningful and intentional life by design, and impact the world around them. For more resources, check out goodegginvestments.com slash podcast. And be sure to join the Investing for Good Facebook community. And don't forget to subscribe and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you amazing new conversations every week. Until next time, keep investing for good.